2020 Connecting the Space Between Us virtual conference and exhibit hall event. I'm Sarah Schaffhauser Wright, and I'm with the Maine's 2020 conference team. Although we would have loved to have been face to face with all of you this year, we are hoping that this is the next best thing for us all to gather together from across the country. This was only possible because of the support of the 18 state and regional associations partnering with MAMES on this event. Thank you to Southwest Mesa, Great Lakes, OAMES, AC Mesa, NEMEP, BAX, SC Mesa, Games, Big Sky, At Homes, Pains, Admia, Homes, K Mesa, MHHA, TexMap, Canes, and Camps. We want to welcome you all and are looking forward to spending a few hours in the next four days. So without further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our first session speaker, Richard Davis, who is the Director of Human Resources at Atlas Technologies, Inc., a veteran-owned technology company serving the Navy and Coast Guard. Richard has over 35 years of human resources and operations experience. Richard is, a cert is certified by the Society for Human Resource Management as a senior human resources professional. He's also certified by the Human Resource Certification Institute as a senior professional in human resources, as well as by the Disability Management Employer Coalition as a Certified Leave Management Specialist. So without further ado, I hand it to you, Richard. Hello, my name is Richard Davis. Uh, I'm currently the Director of Human Resources for Atlas Technologies. Um, we are, are a government contractor and provide technology solutions for the United States Navy and Coast Guard. Um, I make that brief introduction, um, but I also spent many, many years in the um, home care space and medical equipment and home infusion and rehab. So I'm good to be back in front of a, a group of friends that I've known for a number of years. Sorry about that. So um, my session is going to be managing in uncertain times. And here in uh, 2020, with so many things that have taken place with COVID, having to adjust our businesses, I'm, I'm hopeful that the information I will provide will not only help as you continue to move forward this year, but also prepare in the event there's another instance in which our business changes in 2021. And so for this morning, I'm going to cover three main areas that, again, I hope that you can at least take one nugget away. Uh, the first are, are the do's and don'ts, uh, things that we've learned this year that you should do and you shouldn't do uh, during uncertain times. Uh, we're going to address talent management and the talent management component of the session not only helps during uncertain times, but also will help you as you move forward in your business in, in any year uh, with any strategy that you may have. And then lastly, kind of tying it all together, uh, taking what we've learned this year, uh, what we've always known uh, related to talent management and how we run our business. And I, I also want to share with you just a little bit about what we do at Atlas, which I feel is maybe a little unique, and I'm hopeful that maybe you'll see some benefit in uh, that information as well. March 16th, 2020, that is a day for many of us where the earth stood still. For us at Atlas, that was the day that we began working somewhere other than our offices. We were a very remote workforce and flexible workforce, so 250 employees in six locations. For the most part, we were able to work from home, but that date is the date that sticks in our mind, and it also may stick in the mind for some of you as your business changed as well. When the NCAA basketball tournament stopped, where many things stopped, where your favorite stores closed, where the restaurants where you ate would not serve you, March 16th, 2020 will be embedded in my mind forever. So let's talk about what that caused. The challenges that we had, and I'm sure these challenges will be mirrored in your business as well in almost every industry across the country. For us, recruiting and interviewing and hiring 
since March 16th, we have hired 46 people in our company. And with our recruiting team, their ability to find good talent and find people who are willing to make a change, being able to be innovative in the way that we interviewed and screened, and then how we brought people on was a challenge to us. Once we hired them, how, we did, how did we do our onboarding and our orientation? Uh, we were accustomed for most of our orientation to see people face to face, and in many cases, our own onboarding process as well. So we faced that challenge when we were unable to do the things that we had done before. Conducting our regularly scheduled meetings. We have weekly meetings, which I'll talk about later in this presentation. But for many of us, when we were not in the office, we were not able to meet. And that created a huge challenge for a lot of businesses, especially those that rely on people to get together and discuss important issues. The offboarding process and debriefs. Although we've hired a significant number of people, we unfortunately have also lost some people this year. Um, as a government contractor, many times engineers go from one contractor to another. So we have to face that challenge in general. And it even was increased during this time of COVID. And all of our debriefs, we have security debriefs and then offboarding when we discuss the team member leaving and, and information that we need to gather as they leave. So that created a huge challenge for us because, again, we used to do those in person and we were having to do those virtually. And probably the biggest challenge for most of us, and this is just a challenge in business in general, but it was staying connected. When everyone is in different places and you're relying on WebEx and Zoom and Microsoft Teams and other ways to stay connected, the virtual world one in which many of us weren't accustomed to using on a significant amount of time, changed us all forever. So staying connected is probably the biggest challenge that we have faced. And as, a, as an HR professional, that's a big part of what we do. So these were all, those were all the challenges that many of us faced in this year of uncertain times in 2020. So here are some helpful tips uh, that not only will help you as you move forward, because we as a company are still in our operation condition one where everyone is maximizing their ability to telework. So our offices officially are still not open. They're not closed, but most of our team is still working from home. I go from home to the office back, when, back and forth, depending on what I have going on, but there are many weeks where I don't even come into the office at all. So here are the things that you don't want to do in any situation where the business is different than it was, or the environment is different than it was, or the culture of work has changed. And, and we will we'll just call it the COVID world right now, just to make it a little bit simpler. So you don't want to join into the pity party that some members of your team may have. You don't want to commiserate. You want to show confidence. This is the time where you as a leader can, can be that guide that they need at this particular time of uncertain time. You don't want to stoke the fire of concern. I, I know that business changed, and for a lot of companies, it, it, it generated some huge concern about what was the business going to look like in the next few months? Would we be able to survive through the end of the year? What would 2021 look like? So you don't want to do that. You don't want to let the fear trickle down among your team. You need to be that person that does not show the fear of concern. You may feel it, but you can't show it. Don't offer too much there, there. And, and what that means basically is that, you know, sometimes people want to have their hands hold, but that doesn't necessarily give them confidence. And it's this particular moment where you want to provide clear direction. So don't give into the temptation of, of, of showing too much pity. And don't give into distractions. I mean, gosh, I can't even imagine the number of distractions when we're having a virtual call and my cat jumps up on my desk, which has happened a few times, or my wife not knowing before she goes to the office that I'm on a call uh, appears in the background. Um, so those are small distractions, but the bigger distractions are the distractions that we read in the paper or we hear on the news that may either give us hope or give us concern. So don't give into those. But you just have to stay focused on your business, no matter the situation. And if it means adapting and changing, then you need to do that. 
and don't hide or hover. I mean, and you don't want to be, you don't want to hide from the concerns. You want to have open conversations, but you also don't want to hover around people because that generates a lot of concern and doubt in, in the eyes of your team. So these are just some things that you don't want to do in uncertain times, whether it's the COVID 2020 or whether it's just a change in business and in the HME space, it's changes in reimbursement, which we experienced quite a bit in the years that I, I spent in, in managing. And you want to make sure that you don't give into these things at any time where it's an uncertain environment. But here are some things that you can do. And, and then we'll, this will also lead us into the talent management component of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, take care of yourself first. I mean, there's a reason when you fly, they give instructions that you, if you are traveling with a small child, put your mask on first in the event that oxygen is required. You take care of yourself first, because if you don't take care of yourself, it's very difficult to take care of anyone else. Keep people connected. Do your best to keep connected. Uh, we have become more innovative in the way we use WebEx and Microsoft Teams. Not as much Zoom, although we do use that. Whether it's online games, whether it's having an, uh, an internal communication tool that, like we have in our intranet, where we have contests on sharing recipes and sharing uh, pieces of, of personal information that might make people smile, sharing jokes. We do a lot. We've done a lot more of that this year to try to keep people connected. I know with my human resource team, uh, we connect virtually a number of times during the day. In fact, we probably speak more while we're out of the office than we spoke when we were in the office because in the office we had our heads down and we were just working hard to get each of our tasks completed. So keep your people connected. Encourage self-compassion. Encourage others to look out for the needs of others because in the end, we don't want to look out for ourselves, especially if we're in business together. We want to figure out ways that we can help someone else. Here is a very important thing in this virtual world in back, where we find ourselves in a lot of businesses is set clear expectations. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a minute as it relates to talent management. You want to establish a credibility. People need to see you as a leader, if you're in that role, as someone that they can follow. Not someone that creates doubts, but establish that credibility by, by being fair and equitable. And some of the aspects of our talent management conversation we're going to have in a minute will aid you in creating and establishing that credibility. And as always, project confidence in a positive mindset. They need to see you as that person they can follow. And I keep mentioning that because it's so important in these times. I have bent over backwards with our HR team and others within the company to make sure that we are still confident in what we're doing, um, even in the midst of doubt, even in the midst of a positive COVID test that we just had this past Wednesday, in the midst of a team in our Maryland location not being able to work in the, on, on base of the Navy base because someone tested positive and not knowing when they'll go back. Even in those times, we have to project that confidence and be that positive aspect of the day that one sees. I know it can be hard, but it's something that we have to do. And just like the connection, communicate, communicate, communicate. That is very important, whether you do that by phone, whether you do it by WebEx or Zoom or Microsoft Teams or some technology that's improved. Whatever the case may be, you need to make sure that you communicate on a consistent basis. And if you are listening to this talk and you are a leader of your company, it's very, very important that your team hears from the top. Because when there is absence of information, people fill that void with their own perceptions. And in most cases, that perception is not accurate. So it's important as a leader of the company that you communicate, communicate, communicate. So with that said, as we've gone through some do's and don'ts of managing in uncertain times, uh, we're going to spend a, a, a little bit of time here talking about those ways in which you can retain and engage. Because in any, any business, you want to retain good talent. And the way you retain that good talent is you engage them in the job that they do. And so we're going to go through a, a number of things that would be helpful for you. And I'm, and I'm hopeful that you'll get, again, one little nugget that you can take and use in your business immediately. 
So what we're going to discuss about talent management, believe it or not, is it's not rocket science. There is nothing complicated to what you can do to increase engagement and, and help in the talent management world. Nothing I'm going to talk about is rocket science. It's not something that I've created and it's a formula that you plug in. It's, it's, it's basic human behavior, things that you can do that will have a positive impact on that. So the, the first example of information I want to share is, is from a book that I read many, many years ago, First Break All the Rules. Uh, this book was written by individuals from the Gallup organization, and they did surveys, in-depth surveys, and, and interviewed people in organizations. And as you can see in the book, uh, they interviewed over 80,000 managers in 400 companies to determine what the world's greatest managers do differently than others. And you'll be surprised about some of the findings, but the one thing that came out of this book is, is the Gallup 12 survey. And the companies on the top quartile of engagement, based on the survey they did, have a 37% less absenteeism employee turnover. That's huge. 48% fewer safety incidents. 41% fewer product defects because of the increased engagement. 21% higher product productivity and that and, and high and 22 percent higher profitability that higher productivity and higher profitability tie into each other so well and and you need to to understand and know that a highly engaged workforce are going to be much more productive and that always translate into greater profitability so we're going to go through these 12 questions and i'm going to help you understand how it relates to the to the people that respond so these are specific questions in the survey, and this has been turned into a tool that you can research. Uh, the first question is, is I know what is expected of me at work? Question two, I have the materials and the equipment I need to do my work right. And these two questions represent the, the basic needs of any employee in any in organization, the expectations and the tools and resources. Those are so important. And I know it sounds simple, but I can tell you that that is not always the case. And we'll discuss that in more detail in a moment. Question three, at work, I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. Question four, in the last seven days, I have received recognition or praise for doing good work. So I'm a baby boomer. And this question always stands out to me because when, when I was growing up, it was like, you know, you're doing a good job when you get a paycheck. If I'm not saying anything about your work, that means you're doing a good job. Now, that might have been okay back in the baby boomer times and before, although it wasn't okay, but it's not okay today. And it really wasn't okay then. We just didn't really have a choice. But that's an important question. Question five, my supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person. Care about me as a person that self-actualization that Maslow talked about in his hierarchy of needs. Pe people need to know that they're cared for, and that is so important. Even if you're a supervisor, you can share that compassion. Question six, there is someone at work who encourages my development. And these four questions are focused more on the individual and how they feel about themselves, which then translate into, into how they feel about their work. Question seven, at work, my opin opinions seem to count. Question eight, the mission or purpose of my company makes me feel my job is important. And that's that question eight, uh, you'll see as we go a little bit deeper in the session when I talk about some things we do in Atlas, uh, that's a very key part of our business and our culture. Question nine, my fellow employees are committed to doing quality work. And the reason this question is important is because when you leave good people or when you lose good people, more than likely the reason they left is because someone else who was not a hot performer or a top performer was being held accountable for their job. You lose more good people who leave because they said, well, if they don't care about the job because they don't manage or have consequences of someone who's not doing the job, I'll go somewhere else where they do. So question nine is pretty important. And question 10, I have a best friend at work. I have a best friend at work. That is so important. And these four questions talk about how that individual thinks about teamwork. And no one wants to work on an island. 
I mean, even, even the, the best salespeople that their whole business is generating business, they still have to create a relationship with the people with whom they work because not having a focus on teamwork can have a disparate impact on any business. And the last two questions are question 11. In the last six months, someone at work has talked to me about my progress. And question 12, this last year, I have had opportunities at work to learn and grow. 2020, I mean, we've learned a lot of things. We've learned how to do things that we didn't have to do before. We've had to adapt and overcome. So question 12 is, is, is not just important this year, but just in general related to talent management. And these two questions will talk about one's ability to grow. And we all know that if you aren't growing, you're dying. And if you haven't created an environment where your team can learn new things, then you're running the risk that they're either going to look elsewhere or their productivity is be gonna begin to diminish because they aren't challenged. So even if it's working, challenging someone within their own position, you need to look at ways in which they can grow. Um, we are in the process of implementing a new learning management solution platform. We ch changed from our old one and, and part of the content we're looking for are those things where someone can grow internally. I have been fortunate over the last couple of years to become a certified instructor in a number of programs through Vital Smarts, which is a company out of Utah. And so I'm certified in getting things done training, which is a time management productivity tool, uh, the power of habit, uh, creating healthy habits, uh, crucial conversations and crucial accountability. And most of those trainings now are all virtual through Vital Smarts because of the need to do that with COVID. And we made a huge investment and bought um, dozens of those programs where our team members can take those courses online and I can help facilitate their success. But we did that, we made that investment because it's important, especially in this virtual world, that people see they have an opportunity to continue to grow. So I'm gonna talk about the secret sauce for effective performance management. Some of these things will be repeated from what we've already learned, but from my perspective and in my experience, and I've been doing this for a long time, there are these four ingredients, these four ingredients to the secret sauce are so incredibly important if you wanna have a highly engaged workforce and they're not that difficult. I want to repeat, they're not that difficult. And if you follow this formula and integrate the secret sauce into your talent management process, you will learn that it's actually much easier to manage a team. And I stand by that commitment. And I've implemented these, and these have been developed over the years that I've been in management. So the first ingredient to the secret sauce, expectations. We talked earlier about the things that you should do during a time of uncertain business and expectations no different than at any time, whether there's uncertain times or whether there's known times. So a number of years ago, and just a quick story, um, I, I, I created the blank sheet test. I, I didn't do it on purpose, it did it, it came out of a conversation I was having with a, another colleague uh, in an office where I shared. And it was a Friday afternoon or late in the afternoon and I was beginning to try to end the day to start the weekend and they were still at work. And her was name, her name was, was Megan. And I said, um, Hey Megan, are, are you going to be going home soon? She says, well, I am, but I have to prepare for a very difficult conversation on Monday. And I went, well, do you mind me asking the conversation? She says, well, you know, we hired Becky a couple months ago and she's just not doing the job we need her to do. So I asked for permission to provide some input and she of course said I could. So I said, let me ask you a question. If you took a blank sheet of paper and Becky took a blank sheet of paper and each of you wrote down, you wrote, what do I expect Becky to do? And Becky wrote, this is what I perceive I'm expected to do. And you put the two sheets of paper together. Would they match? And Megan was big enough to admit, she says, you know what, if I think about it, probably not. So I asked the, the obvious question, so whose problem is it? And so Megan realized that it was 
that she had not done a proper job of clearly communicating the expectations. And when they met on Monday, and I followed up with Megan later, it found out that what Becky thought that she needed to be done in her job was a little bit different than what Megan had said, had seen or wanted. So uh, the blank sheet test to create realistic expectations is still important. And I, I guarantee if you have these conversations with your team, you'll find out that they thought that what they were doing was what you wanted them to do when in fact it was not. And I'll give one other quick example that's in the HME space. I was working with a client once who uh, they had a, a measurement within their business called Unbuild. And uh, those of us in this space know that you know, you can't build till you gather all the appropriate the documents in order to build. And they kept this percentage, the unbilled, what percentage of their accounts receivable was in that bucket waiting for additional pieces of information that needed to come. And it was much, much higher than it should be. So I just asked two questions. I said, I just have two simple questions. Does everyone who touches this process understand what they're supposed to be doing? And the answer from leadership was, yeah, they, they know what they're supposed to be doing. The next question, the process that you have, is it a good process to facilitate a lowering of your unbilled? And the answer from leadership was, again, emphatically, yes, we have a great process. So I looked at them and said, well, I have an easy solution to this problem fire everyone. And they looked at me aghast, but honestly, if everyone has clearly been communicated the expectations and you have a process that works, then obviously it's incompetence. Well, as they dug deeper, they found out that everybody was doing things a little differently, but they were doing it based on what they thought was expected of them in their job because a blank sheet test had never been done. So expectations is very important as the first ingredient of the secret sauce. The second ingredient is feedback, and there's a very simple way to provide feedback, just general informal conversations with, with team members. Just ask them the, the, the KSS questions. You know, what do you think you need to keep doing? What do you need to think you need to start doing? And what do you need think you need to stop doing? And just these three questions can help facilitate a very healthy conversation with team members related to their job. So the KSS method, you notice it's not KISS, but KSS is also very simple. So provide them that feedback that they need related to the expectations. The third ingredient of the secret sauce is accountability. Helping others succeed is what it's all about. And if you are in business and this is not your mindset, you might wanna consider doing something else. And I know that seems harsh, but in life, if you're a leader in a business or you lead a team, even if you lead a person, and your mindset is, I want to help everyone succeed in what they're doing, then do something else because you're hurting yourself. So it's all about um, helping someone succeed. And accountability is a big part of that. And accountability means people you like and people you don't like. You need to make sure you hold everyone accountable for not meeting the expectations. So real quickly, when you have an issue in your business, let's say you have a team member that's not meeting expectations, whose problem is it anyway? And when I ask this question in live sessions, and that's the one thing we miss with these virtual conferences, but when I ask this question in the live conference, I am told, well, it's, it's, it's my problem because I, I've got to get their performance meeting expectations. I said, no. If you've clearly communicated the expectations and you've provided them all the support and resources to do their job and they're not meeting those expectations, it's their problem. And that is probably the main reason that we make management so difficult is because we make their not meeting expectations our problem. And we make it our problem, then we're responsible for the solutions and we take that responsibility off the other team member. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment, about how to make that a little bit easier. The fourth ingredient to the secret sauce is consequences. If you have expectations and you hold people accountable and nothing ever happens, if they don't meet the expectations, then you're never, ever going to change the behavior and you're never, ever going to change the performance, ever. 
So you have to have realistic, fair and equitable consequences for everyone, people you like, people you don't like. The tendency sometimes is that we, the people that we tend to have a good relationship with, we'll hold them less accountable and you're doing a disservice to yourself and you're doing a disservice to your business. So you have to hold everyone accountable and have fair and equitable consequences regardless of who they are and in what role they play. So those are the four ingredients, expectations, feedback, accountability, and consequences. So I mentioned earlier about whose problem is it anyway, and attitude is a very nebulous term. It's very difficult to measure, but performance can. So you have two issues anytime one is not meeting expectations. They're either not meeting the performance expectations or they're not meeting the um, behavior expectations. If you say someone has a bad attitude, I'm going to ask you to define that, you know, quantify that attitude, because it, again, it's not a term that's measurable. So it's always either a performance issue or it's a behavior issue. So here's what you need to remember as it relates to adding these four ingredients of the secret sauce into a way to help and engage your talent. Anything you can observe, you can change. Anything you can observe, you can change. And sometimes that change may be changing that seat on the bus. And you have to be prepared for that. Because as I said earlier, if you keep people on your team who consistently do not meet the expectations and there aren't any consequences because they're not being held accountable, then your good people are going to leave. Because if you don't care about people not meeting the expectations, their, their perception is you don't really care about the business. So that's very key. But anything you can observe, you can change. So here's the six step process that makes management to me pretty easy. When it comes to behavioral performance issues, you tell someone you state what you've observed to give you a, just a simple example. Uh, let someone's late. You, in most cases, and this is honest, what people do. If someone's late, why are you late? Why are you late? So the person will start giving excuses and then we'll respond to their excuses. And all of a sudden we've made it our problem. So the best way to deal with that is not, why are you late? You just tell someone you're 15 minutes late based on when you were supposed to be here. You state specifically what you observe. You wait for their response. You wait for their response. And in most cases, if I say you're 15 minutes late, they're going to start making excuses. No matter what their excuses, I'm always going to go back to the expectations. So if someone said, if you say you're 15 minutes late, and they say, well, I'm sorry, I couldn't do this, I'm putting this. That may, be, that may be true, but you're 15 minutes late. And no matter what they say, I'm always going to go back to what I observe, which is based on the expectations. No matter what, I'm not going to get into an argument. I'm not going to get into a discussion. I'm just going to remind them of the goal because the responses they give in the, another training that I do are called sidetracks. They're trying to sidetrack the conversation and make excuses. And you have to remind them of a goal as a way to bring it back online. Ask them for their specific solution. Ask them what they think they need to do in order to meet that expectation. And sometimes it's pretty simple. And when you ask them for their specific solution, we all know from basic management from years ago that they have buy-in. They take ownership of that if you ask them for their specific solution. You agree together on the best solution. So my advice and suggestion is already know what, or at least have in your mind, what solution you think works best. But make sure that you fight the temptation to provide the solution to them. So I'm going to give you a little tip, and it takes some practice. For me, it's pretty natural. Maybe it's because I'm I, I sometimes use the word manipulation a little too much. I'm a trained behavioral interviewer, and I have a tendency to do that. But if I have a solution to a problem that I know is going to work uh, based on tried and true methods, and I want to get them to that solution, but I don't want to tell it myself because I want it to be their idea, I'll ask them for their specific solution. And if they give me a solution other than what I think and know works, I, I'm going to give I'm going to give them positive affirmation. I'm going to say, you know, that's a really good idea. What do you think about this? And I'm going to start throwing suggestions out about different solutions and get to the point where they're going to agree, yeah, th that would work. So how do you think you would implement that? And then all of a sudden it becomes their idea, even though it was your suggestion. 
that's just a, a little tip and I will have my contact information at the end if you ever want to have a deeper dive um, or during the Q&A of the session. And, and step six is the follow through. If you go through all of this and you don't follow through either with positive affirmations when the behavior or performance changes or to make, if they aren't meeting the expectations going through this process again, then you're defeating the purpose of what you intended to do. So make sure that you have proper follow-up and that you provide that good feedback. So I'm gonna tie it all together. You know, we have words up there like respect and dignity and uh, we, we've heard that a lot lately. And I think uh, these things are, are, are important. There might've been a time where we really didn't care as much about that. It was more about getting the job done and people were getting paid to work. So these things are less important and, and that's just not the case. Uh, in, in fact, just a little sidebar, um, I've, been, I've been kind of, uh, of watching a lot of the old um, Twilight Zone episodes and, and it, it amazes me, especially when they have a, a, an episode that relates to work, um, how unfriendly uh, people were and, and the, it wouldn't work today and it shouldn't work today because we're all human and we all want to be treated this way. So um, everybody, and I don't care who you are, and if you say that you don't want to be treated this way, I, I won't believe you, but everyone wants to be treated with dignity. Everyone wants to be treated with dignity. Everybody wants to be treated with courtesy and kindness. Everybody wants to be treated with respect. And it's not about earning respect, it's about showing respect. And if you're waiting for someone to earn something, that's not the way it works. Everybody wants to have fairness. They want to make sure that what they're doing is going to be treated the same as someone else. And there's no favorites. And, and I think it's very important as a leader in the business that you focus on. And everyone wants to experience ethical behavior. You know, we see enough already in politics and in business where ethics are not a big part of what a company is based on. We, we actually have um, ethics training that we require all of our team members to take at the very beginning and on an annual basis because that is very, very important. You know, we've been in business for 22 years and our CEO feels that way strongly. Um, and he has a high level of ethics and that comes out in how he treats everyone and how he looks at their contribution to the business. So here's the secret sauce for success. One more reminder that will help you. Clearly communicate expectations. Clearly communicate expectations. So there's no doubt what you need someone to do. Provide all of the tools, the resources, and the support that's needed to be successful. I know that sounds simple, but I have seen too many, and I did consulting for many, many years and went to a lot of businesses. So I've seen this firsthand. How many times one was expected to do their job, but they weren't being able to provide the, the resources to do it? You know, in my job in human resources, I can't, I can't imagine not having the success without a good system in place. Um, having to do things manually and having to rely. I, I can't imagine not being able to do my job without the technology that's now available for us to help manage our team. Communicate often. You can never communicate too much. Now, when we say communicate, it doesn't always mean that you need to get personal with people. Um, I think it's very, very important for you to be personable, but don't get too personal. And so, but communicate often, use that KSF, you know, KSS, what do you need to keep doing, stop doing and start doing as, as a way to stay connected with your team. Um, there, there's another little thing that you can ask, you know, how are you doing? How's the team doing? And what can I do to help? If you just walk around and ask those three questions, how are you doing? And you may get an earful in these days, especially with uh, the uncertainty of education and school, depending on what state you're in. Um, how, how do you think the team's doing? And, and you'll get some very valuable information and maybe something that you'll have to take action on. And then what can I do to help you? That has to be a sincere question. It can't be just a question that you ask in passing. It's a question that you have to ask with sincerity and let them know that you care. Hold everyone accountable for results. Everyone, that's why it's underlined. Be consistent with your consequences. Be very consistent. Sometimes it's almost like being a parent. I know that's not a great analogy, but I actually, sadly, have managed all of my kids. Uh, they're 28, 25, and 22, and they'll probably tell you that at some point in time, I managed them for their behavior or performance. And this is very important. Be fair, treat all with respect and dignity, provide all with opportunities for growth and development. That is so, so key. 
So the last part of the session together is I, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about what we do. Uh, this book, Traction, uh, Get a Grip on Your Business, uh, written by Gino Wickman, has some incredible information in there. And, and we actually have modeled uh, much of our business over the years based on this book. Uh, we take this so seriously that as, as a member of the leadership of our company, uh, we get together um, once a year. We have an annual leadership meeting, and we'll talk about that in a minute, where we actually have a facilitator, a trained facilitator in this methodology that helps us for two days to make sure that we have everything together. Um, and you'll see what that means in just a moment. So uh, within Traction, you learn about the entrepreneurial operating system model. And th this model has components. Um, and I'm going to share some of these with you. Uh, you have, they have vision, uh, data, process, traction, issues, and people. And I'm going to go over some of these right now. Uh, the data component, component uh, we, we actually keep track of metrics every week. So I'm going to go over just a, a, a few of these uh, of this model because it would take a little longer if I went through the whole thing. Uh, the first thing I want to go over are the eight simple questions that we ask. And we didn't just ask them when we started EOS. We ask them every year. In fact, sometimes every quarter when we get together as leadership. So what are your core values? Um, our core values at Atlas are uh, learning, teaching, flexibility, and passion. And everything we do, all our expectations, and even how we review performance are based on those four core values. We have a, a quarterly motivation awards program where team members can nominate other team members on how they exhibit the core values. There's an unlimited number of people who can be nominated for uh, exhibiting one, uh, a, a fewer for two and three, and then we have one big award each year where someone gets nominated and chosen by the committee for exhibiting all four core values. And is actually, uh, we, we have cash contributions to go with this. If someone is nominated for that one, uh, it's a $2,500 reward that they get for being nominated and selected to receive that award for exhibiting all four core values. So what are your core values? Uh, what is your core focus? I mean, most of us know what it is, but you know, we, we actually have these answered in our Vision Traction Organizer, which is a part of Traction. What is your 10-year target? We know this. What is your high-level marketing strategy? We have this identified and we communicate it to all. What is your three-year picture? What is your one-year plan? And this can change, of course, uh, as we've seen in these time of un uncertain times with COVID. What is our one-year plan? What does it look like? What are your rocks? And, and a rock is a quarterly priority. When, when we establish rocks, those are the most important things that one is working on in that quarter. No matter what else they have going on in their job, uh, we want them to focus on their rocks, and we measure that on a consistent basis. And what are the issues getting in the way of achieving all of this? And I'm, and I'm going to talk about how we keep track of that. Now, these, these questions, these eight simple questions, when we ask these questions for leadership, we actually communicate this to our team. Uh, everyone in our company, for instance, on what are your rocks? Everyone in our company knows, what, what, as director of human resources, what are my rocks or my rock that I'm supposed to accomplish this quarter? We actually publicize that. So my team can ask me how I'm doing on my rock. But this is something that we take very seriously. And these eight questions are answered, and we look at them and review them uh, every year, sometimes several times a year. So there are three, three things I'm going to talk to on this page. So quarterly conversations. Um, if you're doing annual performance reviews, and that's the only time that you have a conversation about performance, uh, you're doing a disservice to your team and to your company. Uh, you need to have regular conversations. In fact, our quarterly conversations take place officially every quarter, but we have more conversations almost on a weekly basis with our team. But our quarterly conversations are very specific. Um, our supervisors, they rate their teams, each team member, on how they're meeting the four core values, whether a plus, plus minus, or a minus. And our goal is, is to have no more than one plus minus and no minuses. And if we do, then we have to figure out what we need to do. 
The quarterly conversations also review the ROC, some of their specific accomplishments during the course of the year. And one aspect of the quarterly conversations, which is so valuable, is the team member gets to rate the supervisor on things like, I know what's expected of me at work. We have regular quarterly conversations. We have regular weekly meetings, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So the team member actually gets to rate their supervisor. And, those are, and that gets sent to leadership, and we help manage the team that way. None of these quarterly conversations are supposed to be punitive, but they're supposed to be developmental in nature, and it helps. Quarterly department meetings. Now, this is one that not every department does it because they meet so often anyway, but we as leadership, uh, we have a quarterly meeting. Uh, we have one day where we get away from the office. Well, we've not gotten away from the office lately just because of COVID, but we'll meet in one of the conference rooms in one of our locations, and we will spend a whole day on our quarterly department meetings, and they're all structured the same way. You know, we start off with you know, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, what are our issues. So we, we spend a lot of time talking about issues, but we have quarterly department meetings, and I have a quarterly department meeting with the HR team, and we get, we get together and have substantive conversations. We have level 10 meetings. So a level 10 meeting in traction is a specific meeting that's set at a specific time, the same time every week, and a specific length of time. For our leadership L10, which is from 9.30 to 11, we go an hour and a half. For my HR L10, it's on Thursdays from 10 to 11. And we have an agenda. They're structured the exact same way. We share our business best and our personal best, a little touchy-feely stuff. Uh, we talk about any cascading messages that have come from any, any other L10s. Uh, we have to-dos that we set in place, and we check that. We also go over our uh, what we measure, and every group measures something different. So we have a very a, a spreadsheet, which has a scorecard on it, which we report on each week. But probably the most beneficial part of our L10s um, are, is, what, is what's called IDS. And in traction, IDS is identify issues, discuss issues, and solve issues. So we may have some issues on our agenda, and then everyone has the opportunity to say, so what issues do we have? What issues do we have? And we'll, we'll start with the list. And then once we get the list on our L10s, we'll say, okay, let's prioritize. And they're one, two, three. And the person that brought up the issue will discuss, here's the issue, here's why it's an issue. And then we discuss it and try to solve it. And sometimes discussing that issue moves it up in a to-do, which we put on our agenda as a to-do to be done. And most of the to-dos are something that would be done in one week. At the end of our hour, if we have not discussed all the issues, the issues stay on our agenda till the next week. So nothing's ever lost. And then we talk about what cascading messages we need to send out from each of our groups, up or down. So from leadership, whenever we have issues, we make sure we cascade it down. And then that gets cascaded down to all the other level 10 meetings and on and on and on. So everyone knows what's going on. Um, but the good thing about the level 10 meetings and the IDSing is that information doesn't go without being addressed at some point. That information always stays there. And it's not like we forget something from week to week because it's there. And at the very end of our time, we rate the meeting from one to 10. Uh, I mean, most of the time it's gonna be from eight, nine or 10, but we rate the meeting and we keep that on our scorecard so we can see how we progress um, in our meetings. And you know, the last thing that we do as a leadership team, uh, we actually don't, haven't done it this way, <laughs> but we have a, a, an annual meeting um, and we get away. We, it's either a, a location that will be one flight or right now with COVID, it, we're, we're driving. Uh, it's today, when I do this, when you hear this session, we would have already held our meeting, but we're traveling uh, next week to Raleigh, North Carolina uh, to meet for three days. Uh, the half a day will be internal conversations we're having about some processes and some things within our business. But then we have a facilitator who will be there. And for two days, we're going to talk about AOS, uh, EOS. We've kind of modified it to the Atlas operating system because we have some tweaks to it, but it's still the EOS model. We'll ask those eight questions to make sure that what we have documented for all of our team to see represents a accurate reflection 
of who we are as a company. So we will do that uh, for two days. We do a lot of personal sharing and, you know, and our group is, um, some of us are older, so it's not like it's, and we enjoy that uh, touchy feely aspect of business because we care about each other personally. We challenge each other in a, in a, in a very compassionate way. But the bottom line is, is that, and this is what's so great about EOS, if you get the right team in place, is I have no doubts about their trust. I know that in the end, even if we have a disagreement, they want me to succeed and they want what's best for me. And we've created this environment because of our active conversations through our quarterly conversations, through our L10s, uh, the, the way we are transparent in providing information to our team so that they can see what we as a company are trying to accomplish. So that's just a quick thumbnail on what we at Atlas do that might be a little different. And I wanted to share that with you because some of this stuff is easy to implement. In fact, what's interesting is that the learning management solution platform that I mentioned earlier, the vendor that we chose, they implemented EOS about a year ago. And I have actually spoken to some contacts of mine within the HME space um, over the last couple of years, and they also have implemented EOS. So um, I would encourage you to at least do nothing other than read the book and see if there's something that might be a benefit to input and implement into your company. And the reason that's important is, you know, as we deal with uncertain times, as we deal with doing business a little different than we had done before, we have to be innovative. And I think this year has helped us not only adapt and overcome to some of the challenges we faced, but it's also helped us think outside the box a lot more than we may have in the past. And it's going to serve you well once we get, I hate to use the term over this COVID stuff, because who knows? I mean, we're, we're just now still getting people testing. So it, it could be with us for a while. But what we've done to adapt to these uncertain times is set ourselves up in the future for a little bit more success. What we've done that's worked well, we can use it again in the event another situation occurs, not necessarily a pandemic, but a change in business, a change when reimbursements cut or a requirement that the government provides. I mean, I used to think that the HMA space got audited a lot, especially if you were like had a pharmacy. Uh, it's nothing compared to what the federal government does. The audits that we have to continually comply with in the HR side because we're a government contractor, and there's some, it, is the OFCCP compliance and all the stuff that we have to do. So we've had to be innovative even with that during this time of uncertain time. So um, relish the fact that you've had to change and that you've had to adapt and that you've had to overcome because it makes you stronger and it prepares you in the event something else occurs. So here's my contact information. I hope there was a uh, some key bit of information that was a benefit for you that you can take one thing away and implement it and make it positive. I'm always open for uh, any contact. If you, here's my email address, my Twitter and my LinkedIn. If you have a question, I'm always open to talk. I, I have an affinity for uh, healthcare. Um, I started in healthcare in 1984 with Hillrom. Uh, the six years I was VP of HR for a large regional provider with, with 21 locations. You know, I, I know what we do. Um, healthcare is about taking care of people, taking care of people that are going through physical challenges. And, and what you do is important because it makes and improves their lives. Um, I'm dealing with an elderly mom. My dad passed away a couple of years ago. And, and so we're doing things with my mom right now. And, and what you're doing makes her life easier. And so I have a personal connection with this space. And even though I'm not working in it on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I still care for every one of you who are putting the time and effort to improve the lives of people who are physically challenged, who need our help. So um, good luck and um, I'm available if you'd like to talk. And thank you for this time. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed. I'm, I'm open for some uh, q and I've got some that have been already in chat. So one, one question that was asked was, um, could I give an example of quarterly rock? 
Um, and again, a, a rock is just a goal, and the reason it's a rock that it's a, it's a little bit bigger than just a basic to do. Um, right now, as we are in October, um, an example of a rock for HR and for either me or for our HR team is our um, open enrollment. Uh, that could be a rock with all the steps necessary to get that done um, and, and focusing on that. Uh, for me, for this quarter, I, we just set rocks, and one is implementing our new learning management system that uh, we will be putting in place. And the other has to do with labor categories, which is basically creating job descriptions and titles and pay bands uh, for positions within our company. So those are my two rocks for this quarter. Um, another question is, do you have any quick tips for smaller organizations that allow us to implement the things you were talking about with, without uh, getting overloaded individually. Um, you know, you know, the bottom line is, is that whatever you need to do to stay connected with your team, and, and it's hard to, there's, there's no, you know, one solution fits all. Um, we, as a technology company, we, we already use a lot of technology already. So for us, it was just changing from where we would normally be meeting face to face with meeting on technology. We may have to do it more often and try to get through the blips of technology. Um, so, you know, my, I guess the, the biggest recommendation for you is to, is to find a communication tool that works and use it consistently. And, and it may be that you use it to stay connected in a more personal way than you may have before. Um, um, but it really is whatever tool you feel works with, within your space and with what technology you have available. You know, I understand that some smaller companies may not have it. So, you know, it, it may be that it's just, speaking with people on the phone more often. It may be, you know, sending texts on a continuous basis. Um, you know, one thing that we've done with our healthcare plan is we, we do have mental health and we are open about that, that they can get assistance through our providers and vendors if they need it. Uh, but the most important thing is, is, to, is to get the help that you need and, and stay connected in a, in a very personal way. Uh, and also try to see when people are having issues so that you can be there to support them. As a leader, that's important. Hope that answers that question. Um, another question, have you found that you need to change your expectations of employees during COVID? Do you think that expectations should mostly stay the same or should be, we be making big adjustments? Uh, you know, actually, COVID caused a lot of changes in expectations. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning, and as you know, um, we're a government contractor. So the expectations that are given to us are given directly from the Coast Guard and Navy. And you know, yeah, it has changed. We had team members who were on base. And when COVID started, unless you were an essential vision, mission essential, you, you couldn't be there. And most of our team members are mission essential because we support systems that are active uh, for the Coast Guard and Navy. So, you know, they are mission essential. Um, you know, but we had to see what was the change in our, I'll give you a perfect example. On most contracts, there's only uh, so much telework a, a team member can have. So the government changed it where there was no limit. So we went from people working in spaces to working at home, still fulfilling the requirements they needed to support our customer. Um, I think the most important thing is to uh, individually see if things need to be shifted. I, it, there's no one answer fits all because everyone has different responsibilities. Um, but for the most part, I think you need to you know, look at what needs to get done and, and be very reasonable on what you can get done with maybe limited space or limited resources. I hope that answered that question. Um, the, what was the name of the LMS? I actually didn't, um, I didn't give you that and I'm happy to do it. We evaluated dozens of learning management solution platforms since the beginning of the year and COVID kind of put a uh, hold on it for a little while. Uh, but the system that we chose is called Tavuti, uh, T-O-V-U-T-I. That was the one that we chose after reviewing um, all the others based on uh, us putting internal content, internally created content, being able to bring in external content. So for us, that was the system that fit the way we do business. So I would definitely, if you were looking for an LMS to demo and see what works, not just from the platform itself, but from content. I will share with you that what I found is that very few learning management solution platforms, if they're really, really good, have really, really good contact. So in uh, content, so in most cases, you're gonna have to find content and find a good platform. And some of those are tied together through contractual um, obligations. 
Uh, have you found, okay, I got that. Sorry, I'm going through these. Can you give us some more examples of fun things you have been doing to keep employees connected? Well, we're, we're actually still working on it. Um, we are still in a, as I said, maximizing our telework situation. We have three conditions, op, op, operation condition one, two, and three. We're still in OpCon one, and we are not having active conversations on when we're gonna go to a different stage at this point. A lot of it depends on the numbers and research and so forth. So um, we just hired a brand new corporate communications coordinator. Uh, she and I, she's in the HR department, so she and I are working on ways in which we can stay connected. Um, you know, some simple suggestions have been uh, doing a contest on your home office and, and having some kind of cash reward to incent people to participate. Um, you know, you can do things with pets. There are a number of game sites. I know my, my family and I stay connected. My oldest son lives in D.C., and so we stay connected by uh, weekly games. There are a couple of sites you can log into, and then you can either use Zoom or WebEx uh, to connect, and then we play games. I mean, there's a lot of fun games that you can play, um, and we're going to start some trivia luncheons, just a 30-minute trivia luncheon, just so people can log in and, and, and maybe take a break from the day. But um, a lot of it depends on where your workforce is and, and their ability to connect. So, um, you know, there's a lot of online game sites that have opened up just because of this that I think you can have some fun with. Um, next question is, uh, can you expand on the statement of dealing with performance, not attitude? Great question. I would be happy to focus on that. So attitude, if I say I have a bad attitude and I ask you to measure that, you can't measure attitude. Uh, what's a bad attitude? A bad attitude might be different from one person to another, but what you can do is you can measure their performance because in performance, there are expectations that have been clearly communicated. And so you're able to measure that based on how they are performing pursuant to their expectations. So that's why um, it's always, you know, you can take an attitude and you can probably put it back to behave, behavior or expectations, but I I'm, I'm, I'm feel very strongly that in any situation where one is not meeting the expectations, it's either because of performance or it's because of behavior. And both of those can be measured. They're very objective and attitude is not. I know we use that a lot, but um, you can, and you can, back into a performance or behavior from attitude, but attitude itself is not measurable. Um, okay, I got some other questions and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at them as they come. Uh, have you found positive changes during a negative time? Um, you know, yeah, I, thanks Kip for that question because I think what has happened is people are staying connected in a more special way. Uh, we seem to find out about things that we may not have found out before. For instance, um, COVID has affected schools all across the country, uh, maybe not some as much now in some states as in others, but um, summer camp, the end of school in the spring, the start of school in the fall, uh, we found out things about individuals and their families that we might not have known before uh, because of the fact that we had to take things into consideration on how we were going to help them. And in the end, that's what it's all about, um, is, is staying connected and understanding needs that we may not have done before. Um, and I think that's a positive side. You know, the, the negative side that, again, is important is the, um, the mental health issues that we've seen. Um, there's a lot of bad things that are in the increase because of COVID. So it's so much more important to remind your team uh, of what's available for mental health um, and, and most plans have something, and if not, I, I, you know, I recommend that you try to find something that can help. Um, but uh, there have been some positives that have come out of it, and um, some other questions um, about uh, more productivity, lighter, lighter, tighter processes, monitoring. Um, you know what's really funny, and I think a lot of businesses have discovered this, is that um, we always thought that you had to have – I'll tell you one big thing that's changed. Um, when I, I've, I've spoken at conferences and, and meetings and groups for a long, long time, and I always enjoy asking the question of managers about how much of their time should they spend making sure that people are doing their job. 
And the answer I normally get back could be anywhere from 10% of their time or that's all I do. Well, the honest answer about it is if you have to spend any time with a team member when you've clearly communicated expectations and you've provided them the resources to do their job and you have to spend time making sure they're doing their job, you're either a poor manager, sorry, or they are not as competent as you need them to be to do their job. You should not spend any time making sure that people are doing their job. Now, you provide them feedback and you guide them, but you shouldn't ensure that they're doing their job. So what's happened now where a lot of companies, and maybe not as much right now, but in some in businesses, people are still out, you've had to rely on clearly communic communicating those expectations and just look at their results. So you haven't been spending as much time looking at what they're doing. What you've been focusing on is what they're accomplishing which is actually a very positive side for um, managing a team because in the end, that's what you care about. I mean, if someone works for me for works uh, 30 hours a week and meets 125% of the expectations versus somebody that works 60 hours a week and can hardly meet their expectations, who would you rather have on your team? So I think this is kind of forced that a little bit. Um, I'm not, I don't have any other questions in the queue. Anybody have any live questions? Richard, this is Sarah. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, so we have a question from Rick Hansen. Are there big differences in companies in urban and rural areas in how they are operating and what are some of the biggest differences you see? So even though we have multiple locations, we do have some smaller locations versus larger locations with fewer teammates. Um, there has been a difference in, in how we do some of the things that we need support for. But I mean, for the, for the most part, we've just tried to stay connected with them. Um, the, I think that what, what happens in rural areas where there are fewer people, um, they don't have as many people to rely on and lean on. But then again, even in large areas when people are working from home, it's kind of the same situation. Um, you know, I, I said communicate, communicate, communicate is the key. Um, and however that takes place is is very important. I mean, I wish I had an elixir that I could just, you know, sell across or give away across the counter that one can pour in a glass of water and drink it and everything's fine. Uh, but whatever it takes to stay connected to your team is what you need to do. Uh, whether it's in a rural area or where it's in an urban area, you know, technology is the same. That's the cool thing about what's happened is that, um, you know, I'm from a small little town in South Carolina and what they have available there is no different than what my son has available uh, in, in Washington, D.C. as it relates to technology. Um, so that's the cool thing is that it's kind of even the playing field a little bit um, since we're relying so much on technology as long as we can work it out. Um, do a little sidebar, the most uh, fun I've had during COVID is going to a uh, virtual wedding on Zoom and watching people older than me trying to figure it out. Um, that's been probably one of the joys of this whole thing is the, is the humor that I found in that and the joy. There are other questions. Might not be to read fast enough. I have one here from Paula Bennett. She says, should issues in the IDS section of traction mostly be related to rocks? No, actually, um, very few of the issues will be related to rocks unless uh, when, because we, we also measure whether you were off or whether you were on your rock and, and the planning steps necessary for the rock. So if we say we're off, uh, whoever's facilitating the L10 may ask, is that an issue? Then they'll put that on the issues list. But the issues list generally are kept for those issues that are affecting that group that's part of the L10. For instance, uh, in the leadership L10, if operations has an issue with something in HR, they aren't going to bring that to our L10. Um, we're going to kind of communicate it. And the way our company works that I really like is we have a more linear uh, structure. So I don't, no one in our group has to go up to the top, over, and then back down from the top. They can go straight across and address an issue with someone on another team. Um, the issues are going to be specific to that group and impact most of the people who are part of that group. So any issue with the, um, at our executive L10 will be something that kind of touches everything. And then the person who brought that issue forward, if that's one of the issues we discuss, will, will 
say this is why it's an issue and then we'll talk about it. And we try to stay on track. We try not to stay, get down on the weeds because um, that's not what the issues are about. We try to stay at a higher level. Um, so they could be part of a rock, but in most cases they aren't. Um, do you have some more? I'm trying to read fast. I have one more for you from the chat from Kit Shellhouse. Have you found that certain employees that cannot work out of their home and decided to make a career change? Well, well, we have not. Um, actually, um, you know, since we already had a, a fairly flexible workforce, for some working from home was, was really not that much different than what they had been able to do before. Um, in fact, we've encouraged it so much, and I know not everybody can do this, uh, we actually purchased, um, everyone has laptops, that's part of our business for being a flexible workforce. But we also supplied all of our team members at home, double monitors, keyboards, mouse, um, uh, everything they needed to do their job at home. Um, we've kind of experienced the maybe the opposite way where someone um, had an opportunity to take a position that would guarantee permanent telework as opposed to where we are right now in kind of a, a, an interim period where we will eventually be back in the office. Um, but to Kit's question, I, I, yeah, I, I could see, I could definitely see that happen because you have to be, you have to be very disciplined. And if you're leading a team, um, communicating the expectations and then providing that follow-up um, and really focusing on results, um, works for most, but for some it cannot. And, and I know that there are some people that just cannot work from home. Um, and we haven't seen it, but I could certainly imagine that happening. So um, yeah, that's, but all you can do as a, as a leader is do those expectations, provide feedback, communicate, be positive with them and try to get them through this period. Hope that answered that question. Do you see any other questions? We have that last question in the Q&A section. Any tips on how we can keep oh, okay. from demotivating employees? Any tips on how we can keep de from demoting motivating employees? Um, well, I guess it, it would require me to ask what is going on that demotivates the employee in the first place. Um, if holding people accountable and pursuing fair and equitable consequences because people can't meet expectations, then if they're demoted in those cases, I mean, that's actually a good thing because in the end, you want the right people on the bus in the right seats. Um, that's key. Uh, I don't think you can demotivate people by having positive conversations with them. I don't think you can motivate people if you treat them, treat them fair um, and equitable. I mean, one thing I didn't cover in the presentation that I've done in other presentations is that I have a mantra and there's three that, um, that number one is everybody deserves to be treated with respect and dignity. Um, number two, uh, that everybody has the potential to do great things. I mean, those two specific ones are key. If, if you look at people that way um, and, you, and you positively, I don't see I can demotivate someone unless they just don't want to work. And in those cases, this is where we do not follow the EOS model. The EOS model has a specific progressive discipline process for people who can't meet performance and behavior. Uh, we make decisions pretty quickly. If they're not going to be to meet the expectations and they choose not to, or they don't have the ability to, we'll make those changes pretty quickly. We, we don't let it go for a long time. Hope that answered that question. Um, I think I got another one. What is your suggestion on an employee that is new to the field that wants to be handheld. Um, you know, everyone has a core behavior and, and it could be that that behavior is, is one in which is driving that. Um, they, I, I think that if they want to be handheld, then that means they're uncertain about what's expected of them. Um, and the best way to do that is just follow the secret sauce, clearly communicate expectations, provide them all the tools and resources to help them be successful, um, hold them accountable and have consequences. Um, and it may be that you have to meet with that person more often, but I will assure you that if you follow the secret sauce, even if you have to meet with them more often initially, then eventually that hand helding will go away. Um, you know, I, I've got three kids. Uh, my oldest son was always confident. Um, you know, my, my daughter was confident, but less confident than him. 
and he didn't need to have his hand held. He was going to run ahead and sometimes get too far ahead. But my daughter was always going to stay beside us. And, but as she got older, she got more confident because she, she knew what, was, what she could do. So I think with team members, it's the same way. Just follow the secret sauce, and eventually that hand holding will go away. And the, next, the second part of that is how to firmly let him know that he needs to move with purpose without sounding mean. Just focus on the expectations because if you told me to move with purpose, I'm not sure what that really means. Do I shake my hips a little bit more? Do I walk faster? Do I smile when I walk? Do I look down at the ground? So I wouldn't know what that means. So um, just turn that around and turn it into expectations. Um, and, and that's going to be much more beneficial if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. Um, do you have any questions? I don't see any other questions. Do, do you see any other questions? see any other questions anyone have any questions looks like we just got one in oh okay um any recommendations for managers that are challenged in dealing with holding folks accountable because they are having issues recruiting replacements well this is a good question because i've been in healthcare for a long long time and you know being in especially in the home care business uh would you rather have a um a per per person who's got performance or behavior issues, delivering the concentrator to Miss Smith down the road, um, driving through a neighborhood at 60 miles an hour and hitting a small child. I use that as an example once, and that's very, I, that's a terrible example, but uh, that could be the consequence of keeping someone when you shouldn't keep them. I, I think I may be a little off with uh, that. So if a manager is not holding people accountable because they don't wanna have to recruit people, then you have to hold the manager accountable and the expectations for that manager would be part of, of who he has in place to do the job um, or she. So um, you just have to hold the manager accountable the same way the manager should be holding the team accountable. Uh, not holding someone accountable because of finding replacements is never an excuse. Because if you need to replace someone and you keep them because the recruiting efforts are too, um, too strenuous, then the consequences of having someone who's a poor performer is probably more could be more significant than having an open position, um, and I've I've seen it happen. They've kept people because it's too hard, and then something really bad happens that made it worse. So um, just hold that manager accountable, and you're welcome to call me if you want to talk about it. I'm happy to. I mean that's true with anybody. I'm, I mean not 200 at one time, but if anybody has any questions, I I love helping people help others because uh, in the end that's what it's all about is is bringing out the best in your team and having one, everyone succeed. And if, and if you were a manager or a leader and your mindset is not that, where you want everyone to succeed and do well, then you might want to consider a new line of work. I know that's pretty direct, but that's how I feel. Um, you see any other questions? Oh. Uh, any suggestions on keeping up morale on days there is limited staff due to other staff out ill? Um, I mean, just have to keep people busy. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. I guess it would depend on the situation. It's hard to answer that in just a general statement. Um, you know, if someone's job's at risk uh, and they have that concern, you just have to be honest with people and hopefully they aren't impacted. But I'm not sure really how to answer that. Any other panelists have any suggestions on how to answer that differently? Oh, I mean, I, it's hard. Gosh, when people are out, someone else is having to pick up their work. Um, we just have to pull together and, and, you know, try to work hard at it. Uh, that's pretty much the only thing I can say about that, you know, because we, we've had people out um, with the FFCRA, the special law that was passed for, that was part of FMLA. We've had to deal with, with those issues with summer camp closings and not people not being around. And it is rather frustrating when you've got, someone who was a high performer before COVID, and then all of a sudden they can't get reliable daycare. And so they're, maybe you have them 50% of the time. Uh, that is rather frustrating, but what you can't do is show that frustra frustration to that person because that is not their intent. You know, they'd rather be working, they'd rather their kids be in a stable environment. So um, we just have to be a little bit more patient. I mean, I, I have found, 
I don't know about you guys, but when I'm in the grocery store and somebody's going down the wrong way, when it says one way only, I want to ask them what part of one way do they, do they not understand? I would have never been that frustrated before, but I think some of that comes out with, uh, with COVID. So it happens at work as well, because it's happening, it's happening out there on the roads. It's happening in stores. Um, it's people yelling at each other for not wearing a mask or yelling at him for wearing a mask. It's just crazy out there. So our frustration level carries over into our workplace. And anyone who thinks that personal life doesn't have an impact at work hasn't been around people that much. Um, so you have to be very cognizant of what's going on personally so that you can help them professionally. Okay, so we have some other questions. Um, if you cross train your employees on different tasks, then there are some, uh, then when some are absent, it will be less stressful for them to complete those tasks. That's a great answer. Uh, cross training is very important. We try to do that as much as we can. Um, you know, we try to do that as much as we can without compromising what one is supposed to do. Um, but I think cross training is key. It's very, very important. That, that's a very good suggestion. Um, and you can't cross train people and then use that as an excuse to have them to do that job. I mean, you cross train them so that you have kind of a backfill in, in instances where you need them. You see any other questions? I do not. Well, this is fun. I'm able to give my opinion and nobody's yelling at me. That's great. <laughs> oh, Richard, this has been absolutely amazing. I know the applause would be huge for what you've done for us here today. So thank that you. That was fun. I appreciate being part of it. So good. So good. So I know just in a few chats that I've had already um, that this has truly been something that can apply to anyone and everyone, especially in the DME world. Um, I especially love how you mentioned taking care of yourself. And yes, I too have been frustrated by the one way in there, but taking care of ourselves and helping and staying connected in a setting with clear expectations. It's so important to be the person that people want to follow. So great job sharing your secret sauce. I don't know about you guys, but I think you all would agree that he's given us some amazing action steps with that secret sauce to help everyone thrive in these uncertain times. So if you would like to review Richard's PowerPoint, it is available in the webcast auditorium right next to this session's attend webcast button. So thank you again, Richard. A little Thanks, bit of being here as we move on and wrap up our first session of the MAMES 2020 virtual conference. I'm so excited to let you all know we've had over 270 live attendees and many more will be watching and re-watching the recordings as they become available. When this session is ended, a survey will pop up for you to review this session and you all know we value your input, so please be sure to take that right away. Coming up here at 2.45 Central Time, we will hear from Miriam Lieber with her topic on accountability and best practices in a work from home setting, tying in perfectly to what Richard just shared with us today. And she's great. She's amazing, absolutely. Good friend. We session will be followed by the open exhibit hall. So grab yourself a tea, some water, do a little stretch, and let's take a quick visit to our network lounge and we will see you in just a few. Thank you very much.